for uh, bioethics uh, pedagogy. Uh, and um, today, uh, Barry is going to be speaking about how the NIH plans to solve the replication crisis. Thank you. So uh, the dean of Harvard Medical School used to give a lecture to the students on the first day of class, the new entering students. Uh, and he would explain that half of what they would learn would turn out to be false. And the problem was that no one knew which half. Now, I think this is quite wrong. I think that n not more than 99% of what they learn is going to stay being true because it's always being true because it's rather trivial. So we each have a nose, we each have two eyes, we each have lungs and so forth. All of those things will always be true and our knowledge of them will always be the same. And there, there are some more interesting things, well, semi-interesting things down here. That it will always be true that there's a distinction between disease and diagnosis because it will always be true that doctors sometimes make mistakes. Um, it will always be true that there's a distinction between truth and falsehood because doctors sometimes make mistakes. Without that distinction, we wouldn't have mistakes. Um, now, what Burwell was referring to was truths or assertions about what is changing. And then there are two kinds of change which are important. One is change in reality when a new infectious disease begins to exist because a new pathogen evolves. And then there is change in our knowledge of reality because we have new equipment which enables us to detect new kinds of proteins and new kinds of uh, um, processes that hitherto could not be detected because the equipment was inadequate. So all the changes that are taking place in biology and medicine and in computer uh, use in biology and medicine in previous, in the last decade or decades, have contributed to a gigantic amount of beliefs that people had about medicine turning out to be false. But that's still a minor fraction in the beliefs that have remained, I shouldn't say have remained true, they were always true. Truth is timeless. Um, most of what we know in medicine is true, was true, and always will be true. Now, it's boring. All of that knowledge is boring. It's not worth publishing. It's, uh, Pascal said it, you can have too much truth. It, it's disgusting. Um, but we need to take, uh, pay attention to these boring <coughs> truths. Because all the interesting truths that we want to discover are going to presuppose this gigantic framework of boring truths underneath. That's the first reason. The second reason is because human beings know all the boring truths more or less automatically. They don't need to be taught, especially that you can only smile with your lips. You all knew that before. Uh, but you didn't need to be taught that. You knew it anyway. But computers are absolutely stupid. And they have to be taught all the boring truths. Otherwise, they won't be able to help us in discovering interesting truths. All right, now, in 2005, John Ioannidis wrote this paper in which he made a stronger claim than Burwell about published research findings, namely that most of them are false. Now, the, the, we have to uh, understand what we're talking about here. We're talking about research findings, and we're talking about the subset of research findings which are published. It, there is a sense in which if a research finding is published, it becomes more likely that it's false. That's what he showed. And um, so when are research findings more likely to be false? When, when the studies are very, very precise, tightly focused, 
When the effect sizes are smaller, so 1.02 increase in something, um, when there is a larger number of relationships which are being tested, so that we, we have a, a complicated multi-dimensional <laughs> space of interdependencies, and when there is a reason to uh, make outrageous statements, namely to get published, to get tenure, to get grants, to, uh, for instance, grants from the government, and when a certain topic is fashionable, there is a strong incentive to try and publish a very visible result on that topic. Um, but then, of course, visible means interesting rather than boring. So no one ever publishes boring results, obviously. Um, and when is something interesting? Something is interesting when we don't already know it. And if we know 99.3% of everything already, then it's going to be hard to find something which is both interesting and true. But it's going to be easier to find something which is interesting and false. All right, so Ioannidis' paper and then the, the, the uh, papers which <laughs> followed that paper led to uh, scientists from around 2010 trying to test whether this was actually so by trying to replicate published research findings. And this was caused, th this desire to replicate was caused uh, especially in areas where there had been a series of scandals. People had published false results uh, for, uh, and they, the, the falsity was exposed because of uh, whistleblowers within, within their labs and for similar reasons. And many of these scandals occurred in the domain of social and behavioral psychology. And I'm going to talk a little bit about social and behavioral psychology in a minute. Now, the, pr the precise nature of the problem identified by Ioannidis has to do with what is sometimes called p-hacking. So if you want to publish a striking, interesting result, you have lots of data, you collect lots of data, you collect lots of dependencies between your data. You, you work very hard to have a large space of options from which to choose dependencies between your variables. And then you search and search and through, search through all of these dependencies until you find one with a p-value which makes it statistically significant. You ignore all the others, you put them in your drawer or you throw them away, and you say, I had a hypothesis, I collected all this data, and I proved, and then comes the statistically significant assertion that is going to uh, be published. That's called p-hacking. And there are various forms of p-hacking, but the general idea is that you do a lot of research, but you only publish a tiny amount of it. And that tiny amount seems to be statistically significant when viewed all by itself, but when viewed against the entire amount of data that you've collected, of course it's a random fluke that that particular dependency was statistically significant, <coughs> particularly if your uh, number of subjects is rather small. <coughs> 42 is a good number. So. Publication bias says that all the published results will be most likely to be those flukes. Because the publishers won't want to publish the non-statistically significant results. Um, so they will end up publishing these flukes because the flukes are the easiest way. Well, flukes, it, it, searching uh, and searching until you find a statistically significant result and then doing... <coughs> Uh, reverse engineering on the work you've done by showing that that was the hypothesis that you were interested in testing in the, in the first place. I was never a medical student. I was never a psychology student. But <coughs> I am told on reliable Wikipedia uh, <laughs> sites that students are taught that this is the way to get published results. Um, and I don't know, some people in the room are nodding. All right, so in 2008, there was published a very important paper where 
the psychology community tried to get its act together in something called the Reproducibility Project. And so they, they sought to replicate 100 studies, uh, which were chosen at random on the basis of the fact that they were all published in 2008 in these three prominent journals. So they published this paper uh, called, uh, on the Reproducibility Project. Uh, it was an open science paper. Uh, there's an open science foundation which is backing this kind of activity. The idea is that we should remove the area of secrecy and black arts from science. Everything should be open. The hypotheses that people test should be published in advance and replication should be easy. Um, so this is the paper. This was, it became the reproduce, reproducibility project in psychology. It's incredibly sophisticated. They, they put all their data online. All the statistics they use are online. All the tools, all the software, all the, all the methods. Um, and, and that they are, remember, documenting the, the replication of the original experiment. So they're videoing all the steps. Um, and, and they're doing it with the collaboration of the original investigators. All right, so they found that of these 100 studies, only 36% could be replicated. Even those which could be replicated turned out to have significantly smaller um, effect sizes. Now, of course, this is a published result that might be false. Um, but they worry about questions like that to the nth degree. So they are really very statistic <coughs> statistically sophisticated. All right, these are two examples. Uh, one is currency priming. You can read it. And the other is um, imagined contact. And that when you read them against the background of what I just said, you can prime uh, to see them as being silly. Who would ever believe that? Uh, but they found uh, statistically significant evidence that both of those effects are real, but they could not be replicated. But the most interesting one, which was not published in 2008, so it, wasn't, it didn't fall into this hat, is um, Amy Cuddy. Now, how many people have heard about um, uh, power posing? Just a few. All right. So Amy Cuddy is a social psychologist who um, is very powerful and confident, as you will see in a minute. And she is going to, I'm going to show you a small snippet from a TED talk, uh, which had, when this slide was taken, 20 million views. Uh, many people still uh, are watching it, TED talk. It's a very convincing TED talk. It, she is absolutely amazingly confident. Uh, and it, 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 it's, she had a story of her childhood, which will make you cry. And, and stories about, it's mostly about her female students, because it's about power. She wants to show how female students can become as powerful as men. All right, so here is the video. It's a TED talk, so there's a bit of a outdoor. So I want to start by um, offering you a free no-tech life hack. Um, and all it requires of you is this, that you change your posture for two minutes. Powerful people tend to be, not surprisingly, more assertive and more confident, uh, more, more optimistic. They actually feel that they're going to win even at games of chance. Uh, they also tend to be able to think more abstractly, so there are a lot of differences. We have this evidence, both that the body can shape the mind, at least at the facial level, um, and also that role changes can shape the mind. So what happens, okay, you take a role change, um, what happens if you do that at a really minimal level, like this tiny manipulation, this tiny intervention, for two minutes you say, I want you to stand like this and it's gonna make you feel more powerful. This. So this is what we did. We decided to uh, bring people into the lab and run a little experiment. And these people adopted for two minutes 
either high power poses or low power poses. They come in, they spit into a vial. We, for two minutes, say, you need to do this or this. They don't look at pictures of the poses. We don't want to prime them with a the concept of power. We want them to be feeling power, right? So two minutes they do this. We then ask them, how powerful do you feel on a series of items? And then we give them an opportunity to gamble. And then we take another saliva sample. That's it. That's the whole experiment. So this is what we find. Risk tolerance, which is the gambling, what we find is that when you're, not, when the, when you're in the high power pose condition, 86% of you will gamble. When you're in the low power pose condition, only 60%. And that's a pretty whopping significant difference. Here's what we find on testosterone. From their baseline when they come in, high power people experience about a 20% increase and low power people experience about a 10% decrease. So again, two minutes and you get these changes. And then she was on Stephen Colbert. She was in all the newspapers. You still find many places where they think this is true, unless you read the relevant psychology journals. So. Um, uh, this is a, 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 one of the many stories now about how it's not true, and importantly, one of her own co-authors doesn't, no longer believes that these effects are real. There were 42 uh, study subjects in the original experiment. And uh, it doesn't work. It, it, it's it's, a, a, it, it's a, a very shocking example, first of all, of the way in which a, a, a powerful, influential confident lady can be fooled by something that she really wants to be true, and secondly, about how everyone else can be fooled, because very few people know that this is, this is actually something which no one who knows about the subject matter believes in anymore. All right, so um, the, the, this, the, the power pose was just one of a whole series of effects within psychology. Basically, social psychology was trashed as a discipline. They, they realized that they had to start again from scratch because too many people within social and behavioral psychology had been not following good scientific practice. And um, so one example, which is uh, somewhat more general, is, is the, the view that birth order has an effect on personality. So I guess nearly everyone in this room believes that that is true. It's not true. It's, 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 people like to believe that it's true. Uh, it's sort of exciting, except because everyone believes it's true, it becomes sort of boring. But it's actually, it's, it's interesting because it's false. All right, so this is not just a problem for psychology. It's a problem for all of empirical science. So this is uh, one estimate that uh, every year, 28 billion dollars worth of research in medicine is not uh, reproducible. And uh, there is now an analogous project to the reproducibility project under the auspices of the same Open Science Foundation to do the same thing for a large number of cancer studies. Um, and um, now the, the NIH, uh, and this is what the... Uh, the, the title of the talk is all about. Uh, the NIH has recognized this problem, and, and it's understandable that the first division within the NIH, which um, saw the need to take it seriously, was the Office of Behavioral and Social Science Research. Uh, so the, the behavioral science, the, the, the replication crisis does not only affect pure scientific research. It affects marketing. It affects uh, dating. So there are all kinds of beliefs that people have about how you, it affects predictions about who will get what job. So there's a prediction according to which people called dentists uh, are more likely to become dentists. Uh, this is false, but it's a, a prediction which is an object of scientific study. There are all kinds of applications of these <coughs> kinds of studies in areas like marketing which turn out to be based on false results. And similarly, in behavioral medicine, the same false results were being applied to create therapies which turn out to be based on false results. 
And so in order to uh, counteract this effect, the Office of Behavioral and Social Science Research at the NIH created a strategic plan, which is focused uh, primarily on how the problems within <coughs> psychology outside the field of therapy could be addressed within the field of therapy for the sake of the goals of the NIH. Now, there are three scientific priorities that the, um, the, the BSSR, Behavioral and Social Science Research Office, uh, addresses within this strategic plan. The first one and the third one are pretty generic. In other words, they apply across the NIH. And they, they have only secondarily to, to do with these replication problems. Uh, these are, have to do with the need to share data, the need to use other people's data, the need to know where you can find data which is relevant to your um, science. Um, and th these are problems which NIH-funded research in general is trying to counteract by having mandates for data sharing, which I'll re return to in a few minutes. But the main one uh, is the second one, which has to do with uh, how you ensure that people are engaging in what they call cumulative research. Now, one problem with the existing research methods in psychology is that people are always looking for something different. They're not looking to build on what other people have done. They're looking to find an area where they can, where, where they can produce a, a result which would be interestingly different from what everyone else is doing. Now that is a questionable research practice from the point of view of what we've learned from the replication crisis. What you should be doing if you want to do cumulative science is work on the basis of what other people are doing and divide the domain so that you're not discovering interesting results by accident, which calls into question their statistical significance. Rather, you're discovering statistically significant results on the basis of a common research plan that everyone is involved in. And so cumulative and integrated approach means everyone should specify the hypotheses that they're going to test in advance within the framework of a common <coughs> research plan, roughly speaking. And um, so, <coughs> the reason why you need this is because when you do a psychology experiment, when you did a psychology experiment in the bad old days, <coughs> there were very many effects, clearly, which influenced the outcome of the experiment, but which were not documented. So the, the fact that the experimenter believes in a certain outcome for the experiment could influence the subjects without either party being realized, uh, realizing this. There are many other ways in which these experiments could be uh, affected, which were not documented. And the idea is that in order to replicate an experiment successfully, you would need to know all of those other factors. And no one could predict what those other factors might be. So Psychological science has to start again. It has to create much more careful documentation of the contexts and of the factors influencing what takes place in a psychology experiment. <laughs> and these factors could include factors on the side of the subject, even genetic factors. Uh, but they could also include factors having to do with the color of the table in the room where the experiment takes place or with how, how warmly they were addressed by the people who let them into the room where the experiment was taking place, and so on. So, how do we create a scenario in which all of these different factors are documented successfully and commonly? Well, this is the, the key from my point of view. So you thought this was going to be a talk, with, and I didn't talk about ontology. Uh, but it's, it, 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 it's actually at, at the center of their proposals. So you need research taxonomies, and you need 
research taxonomies relating to phenotypes of all of the various different sorts which are relevant to behavior, which means all phenotypes, really, all human phenotypes. Uh, you need, in order to make these accessible to researchers, you need ontologies to be developed, which will enable existing <laughs> ways of describing contexts or subjects or techniques, methods, measures, and, and uh, uh, observables. You need to have controlled vocabularies with definitions of the terms which everyone shares. And um, the, a secondary advantage of having these controlled vocabularies is that then the data that you produce will be easily shareable by third party. And that is what the first and the third of the scientific priorities that I mentioned were all about. The NIH wants people to share data in ways which will enable the data to be used by third parties, not merely for replication, but in order to form the basis, the common basis of knowledge which enables genuine interesting discoveries to be made. And this is sometimes called the BD2K project, Big Data to Knowledge. All right, now, the, um, it, it, the goal addressed in scientific priority number two in this strategic plan has to do with documenting all the ste steps which take place in a research study for the sake of replication. Now, these steps will very often include software, application of statistics packages. Maybe the statistics packages were created in the lab which is doing the experiment. Maybe they were bought off the shelf. Maybe it's a slightly outdated version of the statistics package that, that, that was used. Maybe the person who was doing the statistics processing didn't really understand what he was doing. There are all kinds of things which can go wrong when you're applying statistics to data. And uh, that's where p-hacking thrives. So you think you're applying a statistics package. You want a certain result, so you, you, end, you find yourself secretly and un surely unconsciously tweaking what the statistics package does so that you ignore outliers when they are going to get in the way or you pay really close attention to the outliers when you figure they will help your statistical significance. Now, the more flexibility you have and above all, the more un or badly documented flexibility you have, the more the possibilities for p-hacking. Now, the, the, the NIH strategic plan wants all of these things to be documented in such a way that there is no flexibility. Now, I'm going to end with a little uh, section on image analysis, his, histological image analysis, which is a black art. And... Um, the, the underlying idea is that nothing in medicine should ever again be a black art, because everything will be cleanly documented. <laughs> All right, so how do we do this? Well, one of the ideas of the Open Science Foundation, uh, which is an idea also accepted quite widely now, is the need for experiment <clears throat> registry. So the idea is that as soon as you have designed an experiment, you immediately have to register it before you start doing the experiment. So you have to register it in a registry and you're going to receive $1,000 as part of this challenge. I've forgotten what the precise conditions are, but there is a prize for registering. Uh, there's a million dollars been set aside, so if the first 1,000 people who register will get $1,000. I think you have to actually finish and publish. But, uh, the idea is that if you pre-register your experiment design, first of all, you will avoid redundancy because once you've registered, no one else will think of doing the same experiment until you've finished. But you'll also avoid the possibility of p-hacking. So what does the registry specify? All of this. And the goal is to create an audit trail, to cut down redundancy, and to guarantee reproducibility. 
And then the problem is, how do you describe the hypothesis? So it, it, is describing it in French sufficient? Uh, is describing it using the local lab argo that you've learned uh, sufficient? Or do you have to describe it in some way that others will, will be guaranteed to be able to understand? Now, the next few slides are from Alex Deal, who is trying to address a sub-part of this issue, actually multiple subparts. Um, you, you're going to have to describe things like the antibodies that you use. Now, the, there are catalogs created by vendors which have long lists of antibodies. And good scientists will list the catalog number and the catalog and the vendor when they explain in their paper how they did their experiment. But now, to specify which antibody you used, if it, monoclonal antibodies come in different clones. <coughs> and um, so this is what it looks like in the catalog. And this is the clone number, 5A6. So you, you're a very good, a really good scientist now. You put the clone number down. And um, the NIF antibody registry, which is one of the examples of registry designed precisely to enable reproducibility of science, uh, created by an ontology uh, savvy group in San Diego, has, I don't know, how many, 68,000 antibodies? Something like that? Well, 2.4 million. 2.4 million antibodies. Oh, uh, yeah, we, yes, yes. So 2.4 million antibodies. So you, you use the, the, the code from the NIF antibody registry, antibody ID here, and... Um, and, and that will give you, actually, this antibody will give you the clone 5A6. So now you're a really, really good scientist. You're giving the actual NIF antibody registry clone ID number. But the problem is that that clone ID is not sufficient because there are multiple different antibodies, monoclonal antibodies being sold by that company with the same clone ID, but with different properties. Uh, because of all of this, which is not documented in the NIF antibody registry. So we created, or Alex created, the antibody ontology, which is designed to solve this problem. This is what it looks like. And um, we did it for 63,000 NIF entries because they are the specific ones relevant to the immunology experiment which we are trying to support ontological uh, descriptions for. And this enables us to distinguish those different clones which in the catalogs of the vendors and in the NIF antibody registry are in fact behaving differently. They have different properties in the experiment. And the antibody ontology, which looks like this, I'm trying to impress you with how complicated this is, uh, which will be relevant to the conclusion of this whole talk. Having the antibody ontology there means that if you give the antibody ontology ID, you'll be able to do all kinds of reasoning with your data, which will mean that you can exploit the knowledge of this particular clone that you're using in ways which will now allow third parties to understand the nature of the experiment you carried out. Now, immunologists are particularly anarchistic when it comes to describing the inputs to their experiment. They, they have far too little in the way of consistent terminology. We're trying to help them out. Now, we're doing this within the framework of the ontology, ontology for biomedical investigations. Uh, this is the top level of this ontology, so it has to, well, I'll, I'll expand it. It has terms like protocol, independent variable, specification, study design, plan, conclusion, textual entity. These are terms which you use when you're describing a study in detail at the level of actions performed and outputs. This is the kind of detail that will be necessary in order to describe the study design in the registry created for experiment. Some of it can be done automatically. So software can be used to tag your 
study design with ontology terms. Some of, some of it will have to be done manually. So here is an example of measuring glucose concentration in blood using terms from the OB ontology. So there is a specimen which has a specimen role, there is, uh, which is also uh, having an analyte role. The analyte role in here, the <coughs> glucose molecules which are part of the blood specimen, and the blood specimen has an evaluant role which is realized by a process which is uh, the analyte assay, which has as its output a measurement datum 1.2, and so on. So that is how the OB ontology for biomedical investigations works. We did something similar uh, for, I don't know if Sarah is in the room, but anyway, I stole these slides from Sarah, who is a student in the uh, <coughs> biomedical informatics department who has an MA in statistics and who worked on this ontology. Um, so this is designed to do the same thing for the statistics and statistics tools that you use. Uh, so we did for this experiment on the effects of nurse staffing on patient deaths, we just looked at the statistics used. And it's quite complicated, as you can see. Now, this, this is not, this complexity is in the paper. It's just in the paper, it's written in English. And it's not written so carefully. And it would be very hard to reproduce what's written in English. But it would be easy to reproduce what is written here, we claim. All of the terms here are defined <coughs> with relevant references and so forth. And then, uh, well, we reuse various ontologies. And then we applied all of this to the histo pathology image analysis. We created something called QHIO. Uh, the, the PI on this effort is in Ohio. So he coined this acronym. So, and, uh, so most of the people, everyone here actually is in Buffalo apart from Metin who is in Ohio. So there you are. So the idea is that QHIO will be able to represent with the same degree of detail the steps involved in doing a histopathology image analysis as we did for the nursing study for the statistical steps. And um, so this is the basic outline of OB, of any experiment. So you, you start with a specimen, specimen creation, then you have a material transformation, then you have an assay, and then you have a data process. That, that's where all the statistics goes, and that's where all the image analysis goes. This is creating the slide, uh, uh, creating a paraf paraffin specimen, creating a tissue specimen. These are all the steps. And the QHIO is meant to have terms for all of these steps. So at the top, we have OB, which is just general study design. And at the bottom, we have the actual processes in, uh, in the middle, we have the processes involved, and in, in the bottom, we have the inputs and outputs. Eventually, an output at the far end will be something like a diagnostic assertion. And then this is more detail along the same lines. Um, so, you can look at that. And then, this is what, um, uh, that shouldn't be there. This is the, the, the general idea. So, we have one institution over here which calls apparent magnification, apparent magnification. We have another institution over here which calls apparent magnification, magfac or something. Magfactor, magfactor. Now, QHIO will give you just one term for those two terms. And so everyone who knows about QHIO will be able to understand this data and they will be able to understand this data. But now we have a research hypothesis, which is that by forcing people who are doing image analysis to document each step in their work using QHIO, we will decrease the amount of black arts in image analysis and increase the degree to which image analysis is a science. <coughs> and so we're trying to get a grant to fund a study on this hypothesis, which would be really interesting and exciting, and we, we, it's going to be very hard to do if we follow all our own 
recommendations. Um, but it seems to be a good idea. If, if the NIH is really interested in reproducibility, then let's do a grant proposal in which the hypothesis is doing this and this and this will guarantee an increase in reproducibility. So that's it. Okay, question. Sorry, it's very challenging. Uh, I just came back from an NIH study section where verification, transparency, and reproducibility was, was really just first introduced. And one of the problems that the, the uh, study section encountered was when reagents are listed, you know, came from sigma or whatever the source is, that's not sufficient. Even if you give the clone, it won't be sufficient. You've got to be able to verify that the reagent is what it is. And to be honest with you, no one really came up with a good, uh, a good way of doing that. I mean, we, we buy our reagents from companies that have reputations, and we assume that the material has been verified. But even if you have an antibody ontology or a registry, how do you really get to the point where the verification of a reagent is accepted as, as uh, appropriate? So one of the goals that we have with the antibody ontology is to enable people who use specific clones to add to the anti ontology information about their success using the clone about its reliability and so forth. Um, and then you could use the antibody ontology as a, a vehicle for choosing clones which have a high reliability score. Um, we, we, so this is, I, I, I have some more slides about why this can't work. And uh, one of the reasons has to do precisely with the fact that, first of all, the NIH doesn't want to tread on the toes of the vendors because the vendors have lobbyists who can talk to the government and so there is a, a sad uh, cycle there which prevents the NIH funding ventures which could cause some vendors to make lower profits. Now the, 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 NIA, the, the, the NIF antibody registry is nonetheless supported by the NIH in a big way and by publishers uh, and and the, the antibody ontology work is being supported by the NIH. So there are some good signs, but the, 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 the really what we would need is the next step, which is having some kind of quality control. And that's the hard part. But, but that doesn't mean that what we're doing is a bad thing. It just means that, that someone has to do this part. Right. Who exactly will watch the watchdog? So... I, some people are believers in the benign effects of social media. Yes. Um, those people believe that if you have num enough people sending feedback about their experiences when using product X, and you <coughs> compile that information, I, Amazon is an example, then you will get at least more information about quality than you would have otherwise. It works with Amazon. Yes, the, the independent reviews, right? Yep. Let me have two kind of naive questions. Setting aside the issue of fraud, um, in the cutting study, uh, what's interesting is not that it always happened that you can increase testosterone by posture, but that it may have happened. And the question is, the fact that it does, it can happen, doesn't mean it happens all the time. And the question would be, how can we make that happen regularly? And the second is, if you replicate a study and you get a different result, what makes you think you've replicated the study? Yeah, so, as I say, the reproducibility project people are focusing like a hawk on the second of your people. So they really do worry about the consequences that you can draw from the fact that a given study was not able to be replicated. And you have to remember that they were working with the original authors who were really interested in the successful outcome of the replication, and they still failed. Um, now, that, what, what, in, what inferences can you draw from that? Um, that, that? 
it, that depends on your level of statistical sophistication. But the inf implications which have been drawn in the wider community of social psychology is horror. Um, so what we trashed our discipline. We, we have been defending all of these strange priming results, and it turns out that most of them turn out to be not. Uh, <coughs> I, I remember my grandmother would ask for recipes and would always deny that she'd ever given them down, but would also claim that anyone she ever got a recipe from had left out some. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so the idea is that we have to work, and this is, this is an idea which is taken seriously by the NIH and by the, the Open Science Foundation and by a lot of social and behavioral psychologists, and increasingly by people in areas like cancer biology. The idea is that we have to work much harder to document those somethings that we originally left out. And uh, your first question I want to respond to, Kim. Well, the fact that something doesn't always happen doesn't mean that it never happens. Oh, yes, good. So I think the problem with Cuddy is that she, and you should see the TED Talk, it really is a moon, it's fantastic. Um, she documented this as a way in which women can be, play a dominant role in committee meetings, can be successful in interviews, be successful in exams. They, all they needed to do was go to the, 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 the laboratory and stand like this for two minutes, and then they would become powerful. That's right. nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> Even if testosterone and power have to do with each other, and cortisol and power have to do with each other, it's constant. And it, it's nonsense. Uh, but she still hasn't accepted it. Um, she probably thinks she's going to win games of chance, too. She's a powerful lady. The important thing about that study is also just the assay that you went for the testosterone and everything. That assay, if you take 42 people and test them five minutes apart, are you going to get that kind of variation just because of that? says, well, what happens if you change something? And in fact, most of the time, if it doesn't work, you can change the population and it does work. But that, of course, is data dredging and big statistics yep. freaks yep. out at that point. It's a, you can't do that, right? That's the hacking yep. according to your... And, and, you know, I sit there and I, I go through these meetings and I've done my own set of trials, of course, here and there. Uh, and it occurs to me that just about everything in the clinical trial business really an end of one study. Every patient is really different from yep. every other patient that you look at. And if you start digging around into it, you can see that pretty clearly. And if that's even half true, then the idea of shoehorning patients into groups in order to create statistical analysis is the fundamental flaw of this whole mess that we're dealing with. And we'll never replicate studies until we have exactly the same patient population. And that's a lot of layers of additional analysis, and of course it's much bigger amount of money. So okay, so do you think we should stop doing <coughs> statistics in order to answer this question? And I know I'm asking the statistician that, but I don't like asking the I'm not a statistician by any means. Um, <coughs> so let me respond with an anecdote. The, the project on which Alex and I are working with the antibody ontology and various other ontology resources. It's called IMPORT, which is Immunology Portal. It's a, a NIAID contract which, which, whose mission is to publish in the, in the public domain all the clinical trial data which is generated through NIAID funding for host side immune response kinds of work. So transplants, uh, allergies, skin, um, um, so forth. And the PI of import uh, is a, he is a, a, a I would say he's a p hacker. He's the opposite of a p hacker. So he is really good at doing 
bioinformatics-based statistical analyses of large bodies of data, um, usually other people's data. Now, he's the PI. He's got 200 and something complete clinical trial data sets, everything, patient data and patient data that he identifies. And one of his experiments goes like this. You have three drug trials, three completely separate clinical trials, each of which studies two drugs and compares them. I'm, I'm, I'm simplifying that. But, so you can take all the data from those three trials, and if you're a, the opposite of a p-hacker, you can do a new trial of all three of those drugs, and you can conceivably get a different result from each one of those trials got about their comparative benefits. And that's what he got. He proved that the cheapest and oldest drug was, in fact, the best drug by compiling all the trial data together. Now, that paper still hasn't been published, however. It, 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 but the original result he got two years ago, and he's been going round and round and round with the reviewers because there's always something slightly wrong. But that's the idea that I have in mind, at least, that that kind of meta-trial based upon the original data from other trials will be more and more possible because more and more people will be, I'm going to be very careful now, encouraged to take the trouble to document what they do carefully using uh, resources like the antibody ontology, which will allow you to allow you to do all kinds of experiments virtually rather than with real patients. Can I follow up to that? I mean, meta-analysis is the way of all things like that. That's all you're yeah. talking about, oh, yeah. meta-analysis. Nobody in, that does meta-analysis ever has enough detail to really truly compare the patients. They just compare the statistical results. And sure, you're going to get you know, sooner or later regression to the mean, you got enough studies going one way and enough studies going the other way, it's pretty, but pretty much you're going to end up with no effect. And that's, in fact, what usually happens. With <coughs> it doesn't solve the problem. So I'm not suggesting that what his name is Apple Hugh uh, is solving the problem. I'm suggesting that that sort of work becomes more possible if people take the trouble to document it in the ways that I'm recommending. And, and ways which are going to become Actually, more and more. Actually, what you is not meta-analysis. It's going beyond that because you're looking at the original data and reanalyzing the original data. It's not looking at the statistical data that came out and starting running it on the keyword. Yeah. So it goes beyond. What? So I, I agree that you should dig into the data. I would, please don't mistake my intent here. Most people don't, know it. Yeah, so we're what that. that. That's the problem. We're trying to make it easier to dig into the original data because the data will not be closed in secret code. The data will be exposed to the, uh, uh, the, the third parties who might want to reuse it. And that's the whole... Uh, yeah, we'd like to have more published real data. Yeah, that's the whole purpose behind import. And I think import now is the world... Of the NIH trials. But I think you, you can get really good data from the import complete clinical trial data for 200 and something trials. Um, that would be interesting. But, but my thing is, I mean, if you look at the incremental increases in uh, the advancement <coughs> of science that you have seen in the last 50 or 100 years, has happened because of this research based on p-hacking and it has improved our knowledge, right? Just better diet, isn't it? What's that? Better diet. <laughs> so that then uh, takes us to so the <laughs> clearly we're doing a lot of things right just at the moment we're becoming more and more acutely aware that we might be doing certain things wrong and we need to focus on how we can make sure that we're not doing those things wrong when we know the, <clears throat> the sorts of consequences of what we're doing so maybe one way on daily basis fixing this problem is when submitting a paper Maybe we do need to have to submit the core data set with the paper so the reviewers can do their own statistical reanalysis. Yeah, some journals. The paper. Yeah. I think you in the journal did yeah. that. Yeah, some but, journals yeah. require that already. That will become more and more required. Um, I, I, again, I go back to the same uh, argument. If you submit the data with your paper but you don't explain how to use that data because it's closed in secret code, which even you may have forgotten the meaning of. 
uh, then no one can use it. So you have to you have to curate your data in such a way that it's described in ways that other people can understand. And that process of curation involves the use of common ontology. Yep. The the ontological maps that you showed uh, for papers, where it described the system that was used, the inputs, the yeah. outputs, and the processing. Those seem like really great ways to help people communicate one paper to the next, yeah. what they've done. Have you seen that grow any pop popularity? Do you see that being published? Yeah, so papers? several journals now mandate that the paper have not merely an abstract, but a pictorial summary. So the final slide, this slide actually, is the pictorial summary of our QHIO paper. I'm not a, a big fan of this slide, particularly not when I try and read it. Um, but that's an example. Now, these are not the, the, the kinds of detail that would be required for a typical experiment would be too big to create a, the equivalent of a pictorial abstract. Uh, but gradually, this kind of approach is being used. And the, the OB paper that I showed a few slides back was published just a few weeks ago. It already has 13 citations. So people are really keen on this kind of uh, research. Okay, that's it. Thanks very much.